Raging Cajuns podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Wilson, alongside a very, very special guest again, two-time Olympian. Two times. Two times. Assistant Director for Diversity, Leadership, and Education, the Hollis Conway. Really? Is that all me? Come on, man. It's all you, man. <laughs> yeah. well, how you feel? Feel pretty good. pretty good. We're in the middle of a busy, busy semester, a lot of things going on, but I'm looking forward to summer break. Okay. Okay. So let's start off this way. What's <clears throat> Motivational Mondays? That's probably the most special part of my job. It's, it's pretty cool because I get to touch every department, you know, from strength and conditioning, sports medicine, senior leadership, administrative assistance. And we spend about five to ten minutes giving them a little nugget that should help them get them a little bit closer to being self-motivated, not externally motivated. And because of those meetings, I get to have intimate conversations with each part of our staff and get to know people and their motivations and their hurts and pains and, and give them a little something that will push them down the road a little bit longer. So Motivational Mondays, you sit down and speak to internal staff members of athletics. Yes. And every, every department. Who created this? I think we came up with it together. It was just kind of a part of my job is to kind of be a motivational force. And one of the things I talked about, it, hey, we need to maybe do something with our staff. You've been, uh, you've been <clears throat> motivationally speaking for a very long time. You've been speaking at churches, at schools. Um, now businesses. Been, yeah, businesses. <clears throat> blessed to have you here with the University of Louisiana now. Um, why is that so important? You know, crazy story. I grew up. I grew up in some tough conditions. I'm the baby of seven, a lot of drug use, underage pregnancy. Uh, they dropped out of school, mom and dad, just uh, conditions that were not conducive to success. And I fought so hard to escape that. It really was the driving motivation for my success as an athlete was I just wanted to get, get, have a better situation. And, and I've been blessed. You know, God blessed me to travel the world. You know, I've been over, you know, 36 different countries, travel all over the United States, just see things and and at some point you know god said you know that wasn't just for you you got to give it back and 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 one day i just had this revelation that i want to be able to give back as much or more that was given to me and so it just i look for every opportunity to to motivate to inspire to encourage to break down barriers i can get into places uh, as an olympic medalist that i probably couldn't get into as a black male um so I just look for every opportunity to go to as many different places, have as many different opportunities to do that. And, and it's always easier when you're encouraging and motivating. Let's go back to Chicago. <laughs> Shot town Where young uh, Hollis <clears throat> Conway was born under rough conditions. Yes. What, what happened there? Uh, well, the first thing is when I was born, I was stuck up under my mom's rib and my head got smashed. And the doctors didn't know if I was going to be a normal child. And that question kind of still exists today, <laughs> but I think I am. Uh, but my grandmother used to have to take me twice a day and just sit me on her lap and just kind of physically literally mold, me, literally mold my head, which is a pretty cool story because my grandmother, she died. She was almost 102, but her last 10 or so years, she lived with us. And so early on where she got to mold my life, we kind of got to mold hers at the end. Pretty cool. Um, but my uh, my mom and dad had a rocky relationship, and um, he left my mom and went to Detroit. And then they made up, and we all moved to Detroit. And then they rocky relationship, and they broke up, and he left and moved to Shreveport, Louisiana. And they made up, and we moved to Shreveport. And so we kind of had those kind of deals going on. Um, my my five, five sisters, four of my sisters, uh, struggled with drugs, alcohol, various things, got pregnant. One of my sisters graduated from high school on time. Um, and so we grew up in some conditions that were not conducive to success and all the struggle that go along with those things. And, and even in spite of all the bad, poor choices that they made, the difficulties of their life, they made sure I didn't experience that hmm. because they were like, if I ever catch you doing this, I'll kill you. Now you're speaking to about my your sisters, sisters. Yeah, okay. my sisters, and they, and my are, brother. They all older than you, or oh yeah, I'm the baby. Okay, I'm you're the, the baby. last of seven. Oh yeah, they did not like me because mm. I was spoiled. Mm. I was spoiled, and as I became, I became successful as an athlete early. They really didn't like that. So you were spoiled, and then had oh, success. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. and I got to do things they didn't get. They didn't get a chance to do, but we learned a lot um, from my grandmother because she was the central force of the family. The 
steady rock the um you know for christmas you know we didn't have anything so you look for that box from her that's gonna have some underwear and t-shirts mm-hmm. and things like that mm-hmm. it, it was grandma all mm-hmm. the wisdom everybody called her um and so ironically enough when my mom died because it was uh my mom had a real bad relationship with a lot of my sisters because she her and my dad kind of lived their own life it was fend for yourself and um there was a lot of healing that took place at that at that funeral and but my oldest sister told me this and i never knew this. she said you know i had dreams of going to the olympics she was one of the fastest people in chicago and when my mom and dad made up and moved to detroit she um they took her and she had to give up her dream because she had to babysit the rest of the kids and i didn't know that so she lived with that hurt and frustration all her life and just to be able to hear that, it also put it in perspective to me that, you know, I wouldn't be who I am without them and the sacrifice that they made. And so it brought a lot of us together, but a lot of that was produced out of chaos, frustration, difficulties. And my older sister, she's been clean, who probably 28 years, been amazing. My brother, he's been clean probably 26 years. I know October 31st is always an anniversary of his uh, day of being clean. Um, I have two sisters that still out there bad struggling um but that's the life i grew up in it kind of shaped my perspective to understand no matter how high (laughs) literally how high Mm -hmm. i jumped um uh that it wasn't built on just me you know doing everything i could do i had a whole family that even in spite of their difficulties and frustrations and pain that made sure that i made the right decisions the two sisters that are still going through it What's your communication with them? Oh, we talk all the time. You know, it's um, when you live this life, there, there are certain harsh realities, but there are realities. You know, I got one that struggles with alcohol and one that probably struggles off and on with crack, you know. Um, but we talk, they'll call, but those conversations are quite interesting, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, they are what they are, you know. You're talking to, you know, basically a crackhead and an alcoholic. Mm-hmm. Um, but... We're, we're, we're close-knit family. We're, I've learned a lot being in, in Louisiana, the closeness. You know, my, my wife and her mom will talk like sisters. And my family, we could go six months to a year without talking to each other and pick up, and it's just, you know, everything's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, it was just different that way. But, yeah, we, we talk pretty right. We, we made a promise when my grandmother died that we would stay in touch and do better. And for years, Thanksgiving— Everybody came to my house. They came from South Louisiana, you know, Shreveport, where a lot of them, we would have probably 25 people in my house that whole week. We'd have, they bring air mattresses, every spot was filled, and we just spent that whole week cooking, eating, dancing. Um, we've been doing that for years, so it's gotten better, you know. And there ever a moment where you felt guilty for, you know, um, having to be babysat and possibly ending a sister's dream or I was spoiled man yeah. no <laughs> uh no because a lot of it I didn't realize until you know my mom's death I mean we, I'd live my life I was on the back side of my career and mm-hmm. it was more of understanding the sacrifices my sisters made but at that point they had made peace with their life and we we're all in good places um I, I believe everything that we go through makes us who we are and 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 we live with that, but no, nah, never felt guilty. I felt grateful. Um, I think it brought us closer. I have greater appreciation for my family and and the struggle that they were going through. My brother, you know, we had a it was a horrible incident. Yeah, you know, I was over in Europe one time, and my wife opened the door, and he was sleeping in the doorway. He was just she opened the door, he's in the doorway, so she lets him in. Sure enough, some money and things end up missing. And so I have to tell my brother, who I love, you can't come to my house when I'm not there. Well, you know, years later when he's clean and, and we had a great relationship and he's standing and he, you know, through his program, he has to apologize to me. Mm. And that was the most difficult thing because he didn't have to apologize. I, I didn't need him to apologize. And for him to look me in the eye and to do that. And so um, those things have made us closer. You know, I think I have much more respect for them than I think they should ever have for me. I just went out and jumped you know Mm -hmm. they they lived life and and are winning so when did you find sports oh i found it early Mm -hmm. you know i i i had to i had to find a way to 
escape my only meal a lot of time was free lunch during the summer mm. you know we you know you weren't making a lot of good decisions back then um and so i figured education wasn't gonna be my i wasn't the smartest tool in the shed but uh i wanted to be an athlete so i went out for football and i coach didn't even give me a chance i mean i, told, I wasn't even good enough to get cut from football and I went off for basketball and got cut. <laughs> wait, you know? wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so, so, the, so the football coach saw you and was like, no, you're, you're Well, okay. me and my buddy, it was tryouts. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have any cars. So we walked from our neighborhood. The, my friends on our block walked to, to the school for tryouts. Okay. And you walk up to the coach who has a clipboard who's telling, getting your name and your information and sending you to the locker room to get some equipment. Mm. When he sends them to the locker room, he sends me home. Mm. <laughs> I didn't even get a chance to try out to get cut. Yeah, so, gosh, darn it. I, my dream was to be an inside linebacker for the greatest football team in the history of football. Chicago Bears? The Pittsburgh Steelers, oh, okay. baby. Come on. Mean <laughs> Joe Green, Dwight White, L.C. Mm, Green, mm, Jack mm, Ham, mm, Star Wars mm. Swan. Oh, here you go. I mean, it's, <laughs> you know, immaculate reception is God's team, you know. So, anyway, um, I, I, I didn't get a chance. And I went out for basketball, and I, I made it to the last cut, and, and I got cut. And then I went out for track. It's my freshman year, and I ended up making the uh, track team as a JV high jumper. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't make the opening height of the varsity meet. And then the next year, I was one of the best jumpers in the state. I jumped 5'5 five, five my freshman year. I jumped 6'6 six, six my sophomore year. What do you attribute <clears throat> that to, a growth spurt or just focus? Um, no, nothing I did because mm -hmm. I just went out and jumped. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't work ethic. It was just talent you know um because the next year i jumped 16 jump you know um 48 feet in the triple jump 21 feet in the long jump you know just and so Unbelievable i wasn't, I wasn't doing anything special you know yeah. i became a star pretty early and by the time my senior year i jumped seven two fifty feet five and and 23 one so i'm one of the only jumpers that ever go over seven feet, 50 feet. I'm in the seven foot club. I one of the top jumpers in the nation. I'm being recruited. So that happened pretty quickly, mm. you know, but I wouldn't do anything special. I mean, I, I skipped the weight room. I, didn't, I mean, I was just. You just it, naturally it, gifted. It, it was naturally gifted. And, and I, I found where, where God had placed my gifting and, and I stayed with it and success happened. Why the University of Louisiana? That's what we call it I was it today. tricked. <laughs> I was tricked. I was going to Texas A&M. I was going to be an Aggie. Mm. Um, growing up, you know, of course, I'd not been out of Shreveport. The first time I went out of Shreveport, uh, my track coach took me to an indoor meet in Jackson, Mississippi. So I hadn't seen anything, didn't know anything. Young and dumb. Now I'm being recruited. It's a funny story. I did not take a recruiting trip to the University of Nebraska because the movie Children of the Corn came well, out. Come on, man. I don't blame you on that one. <laughs> I did not go to Nebraska. <laughs> but I was recruited all over the country, and I took three trips. Mississippi State, which had a tremendous track program. Texas A&M, who has one of the best track programs in the country, and the current American record holder in the high jumper in the high jump was named Jimmy Howard, and I wanted to go there to be the next Jimmy Howard. Mm. And Dick Booth, who was one of the premier track coaches, field event coaches in track and field, he's had more Olympians, um, more All-American NCAA champions, and the University of Arkansas track program was the premier program left there to become the head coach here and he was a silver tongue and he he worked me but he he said things that shaped my life today you know he said you don't need to go there and be the next jimmy howard come here and be the first hollis conway he, he gave he gave uh value to my name um he said you don't need 10 sets of hurdles you can't run but one set at a time which we only had one set here <laughs> you know mm -hmm. but he, he taught me life lessons you know i remember him telling me you know it's just as easy to keep your gas meter on this side of half as it is on that side of half. Things I just never thought about, but he was like a, a father figure to me, and he, he talked me out of going to Texas A&M to come into southwestern Louisiana. He got you. Huh? I didn't know anything about the culture. I didn't, it took me years to uh, figure out that G-E-A-U-X was actually go. Mm -mm, well, you know, because they were chanting at the game, and I'm like, what are they saying? Right. <laughs> you know, right, right. and lanyap and all this stuff. I don't eat seafood. I definitely don't eat crawfish. So I, I was literally a fish out of water.
today you still don't eat? Oh, I don't eat seafood. I, I'm I'm horrible. I don't eat Mexican food. There's only a few things I eat. They're not Bur- good, mm-hmm. but um, oh, I love breakfast. Now I'll eat pancakes and grits and sausage, but I love to have rice every day, fried pork chop. Okay, you know, okay. Fried chicken, that kind of stuff. Put a little Cajun <laughs> seasoning on that thing, man. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I think you got to have some uh, cayenne pepper on there. I like my that food. Counts, right? uh, yeah, <laughs> I like to have my food spicy. <laughs> You're at UL and you have extreme success. You become one of the best, uh, you know, athletes in America. Um, how did that come about? When did, do you, are you saying that coach kind of brought out some work ethic out of you? Oh, yeah. Shaped, when when shaped I first everything? got here, the first thing he said is, we're getting you in the weight room. I mean, and... How much did you weigh coming out of high school? Uh, 138. Wow. 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 <laughs> right at six feet. Wow. I mean, but at my peak, I was six, six feet, feet, 142 pounds. Gotcha. So, I mean, I, I was a massive hunk of a man. <laughs> you you know put on I that mean? four pounds of muscle. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and I never lifted weights, never did much. And so coach was crazy and I was crazy uh, as far as work ethic and drive. We did things that, um, no coach today would recommend athletes. There's such a there's much there's a much smarter way to do things with neuromuscular training and and just the physiology and the science behind training. We were the old Rocky where you lift tree stumps and stuff. Mm-hmm. He would come out and say, "Hey, let's put this 20 pound weight vest on and do one legged bounds up the hill." And I'm like, "Cool." I mean, we did crazy stuff, but his problem to me with me was toning it down because we had this philosophy you never end on a bad jump on a bad rep and so if I have 10 sets of hurdle hops and I can't get through on that 10th one you don't stop so I may end up doing 20 to get through on it mm-hmm. on the last one and so we did that on everything but by Wednesday I've done you You're know burnt. two weeks work of work and so I was just a maniac and so I went in the weight room and you know I couldn't squat 135 pounds as a freshman you know, four years later, I squatted 575 pounds. I was strong. I was fast. Um, had this incredible work ethic. And every year, I would get hurt. Uh, and then when I come off an injury, I'd set records. <laughs> I, you know, because I was part fresh. of the game. Right. Yeah. And, and we train, shoot, almost year round. We we lightened up the peak at certain times. But that recipe of my work ethic, um, the creativity, and my ability. Like my freshman year, I jumped seven six, and I jumped um, fifty three feet in the triple jump and twenty five feet in the long jump. I qualified for the end season, the high jump and triple jump. It was incredible. And then the next year, I jumped seven eight. Of course, my triple jump and long jump kind of kept going down, but my high jump kept going up. But it was, I had big leaps. Um, very, I mean, seven six seven eight. And when next year, I'm jumping at the American record, and so um, it happened fast. And I'm still. An immature young kid who hadn't seen the world mm-hmm. um, experience in life. And so I was, I was ignorant. The first Olympics I went to, I wasn't projected to go. I, I finished second at the trials. It was why I didn't really know what it all meant. And I went to the Olympics just really to have fun. I, yeah, let's, let's get into that because, yeah. uh, you know, uh, South Korea. Uh, Seoul, South Korea. Um, wasn't the, uh, we'll say, safest place um, in, in the world um, with uh, situations with North Korea that, and not the best facilities in the area, so kind of where the Olympics were was the the granddaddy of them all. Right. Um, how did that come about? The uh, you get the call, and then the the pageantry of the Olympics. Were you ready for that, or what? what? I had no clue. Yeah, I I didn't know anything about the world and what was going on, and we were really, we really didn't feel any of that back then. So what happens is that in track and field. There's standards to go to the Olympic trial. You jump the standards, you go to the trials. It's open for anybody. So I think the standard was seven, four and a half. Anybody jump seven, four and a half, you make it there. You know, if you're a sprinter, you run the time. So, and then at the trials, it's top three. Unless you're a sprinter, you know, you get top four, make the relay and two alternates. Um, but it's open for anybody there. So you just go there. I didn't go there expecting to make the team. I, I made the Olympic trials. It was in Indianapolis. It was hot. I mean, it's mm. a thousand degrees on the track, no shade, mm. and the high jump. It it is one of the longer events because you may have forty high jumpers, so you run in two pits in the preliminaries, and they'll have a automatic standard to get to the finals. Everybody who jumps seven five and a half will go to the finals or the top twelve. Um, 
And so there was always some kind of strategy. You're looking to see who's on which pit because you don't want to be out there. It's four hours you're out there jumping. And you're trying to say, okay, we got three people over here. Well, we know there's only four over there, so we're just going to not jump this. We're going to run through and take. They hated that kind of stuff. So you got all this stuff going on. But So I ended up you know, making it to the finals. And I'm there. I'm just jumping. I'm flying. I'm having a good day. I'm jumping. And then um, there's probably six of us, you know, somewhere around the height. Um, what did I jump there? I think I jumped seven, seven or something like that. But, you know, I ended up finishing second. I don't know. I'm running around the track, carrying the flag, you know, taking the victory lap and enjoying myself. And then, uh, so you know you're on the team. Mm-hmm. And you come back, and then there's a date where you go through processing. And back in 88, you could literally go at the beginning of the Olympics and stay through the end. Because Olympics okay. is a long period of time. I think it may be two weeks because you got mm-hmm. so many events going on. And track sometimes could be at the beginning or it could be at the end. Mm-hmm. And um, so I went through day one. And we went through Los Angeles, did a Disney World. Hadn't seen any of that. Or I think it's Disneyland. And, and, and they gave you all your kit. Everybody that's a sponsor give you stuff. So you get boxes of stuff and you get those uniforms. And, man, it's pretty incredible. So that's all I'm thinking. I'm enjoying myself. I go over to the opening ceremonies. You know, you're out there. It's it's great for people watching, but it's not great for the athletes because you have to line up for the march to come in. You're alphabetically. United States is all the way in the back. And so while mm-hmm. you're watching everything that's going on, we're, we're lined up out back behind the stadium. And so you, you can stand up out there for over an hour just standing. And then you march in, which is great, and you do all that, but then you stand in the middle of the field. So it can be pretty draining on you if you have to compete. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I, that didn't matter to me. I was, wasn't there to win. I was there to take in everything. Yeah. And it was probably the most – those two times were the most incredible time of my life because then there, um, there was unconditional love and support. Didn't matter what color I was, didn't matter what neighborhood, didn't matter what political party, didn't matter anything. I was an American. Mm. And black, white, Republican, Democrat, rich, poor, everybody was cheering, chanting USA, calling my name. That's pretty cool. I don't know many places where you feel that, um, where the country will get behind you, irregardless of any other detail. And so I went out there, and of course you have the prelims, which is going to be four hours. And I was just taking massive, I was making jumps on the third attempt. You want to make jumps on the first attempt. Um, At the Olympics, there's a a standard. Even though you make the team, you have to make the A standard, uh, which they say everybody jumps seven, six countries that can do that. You can get three people in. Mm. But if you have somebody who can't make the A standard, you can get one at the B standard, which is lower. So you have countries, you know, African countries who may not have any high jumpers. They can still send a high jumper there. But what happens in competition, you have to start the ball really low. Um, and so competition, you know, is very regimented. You you get on the bus at a certain time, you get to the hour, the stadium, maybe four hours before because you have to go through all these security checks and then you have to go through rooms where they check, make sure your uniform match. You have to declare what shoe company you're wearing because they match logos, the sizes have to be right, the logo on your sock. Mm-hmm. You know, you got to do all that stuff and then you, you go out, you do your warm up and then you have to official line up for the introduction. You line up, you march in, you do that. Then you go over to the high jump apron. You gotta, and so, you know, it could be an hour between the time you warmed up when you have to compete but when the competition start you can sit there another hour before you actually jump because i'm going to come in maybe at seven two but they're they're starting at you know six two Mm. and so it's a lot of strategy but i'm just out there jumping so you had four hours in a prelim then you come back in the finals and so i'm making jumps on second and third attempts which means you're taking a lot of jumps but i keep making heights and and then I made seven, eight, and three quarters, which was the personal best for me. Um, and but there, I think the Russian who won jumped seven, nine, and three quarters. But I think third place was seven, eight, and three quarters. And you had a few people at seven, eight. So I'm right in the mix. But I get a silver medal. Pretty exciting, but I don't know what that means. Hmm. I didn't grow up watching the Olympics or knowing anything about it. It was not anything that was big time in our neighborhood. So, uh, but I enjoyed it. It was really, really fun, and I didn't realize the impact until I flew back home, and Lafayette went crazy. I mean, the people at the airport, I mean, they was there. There was, you know, signs, and, you know, I think the mayor was, it was pretty good. Then I was um, grand marshal of the homecoming parade, and I remember our homecoming game. They did this deal where 
I surprised the fans. Uh, they they had the band was performing and they had this big American flag that they opened up while I was dressed in a band uniform. And I went under the flag and took it off. And when they moved the flag, I was standing in the middle of the stadium. So it was pretty incredible stuff that was happening. And that's when my life really changed. Who were you um, sharing these moments with personally? Was there you know, media family in touch or? Yeah, you know, my family, uh, you know, because this and, is big, monstrous stuff that, you know, without support could kind of get overwhelming. Well, you know, I'm still, I'm still driven to win. I, I, you know, those things were great, but I didn't win a gold medal. Mm -hmm. I didn't break the world record. I mean, I had gold, so I enjoyed those things, but inside of me, I didn't accomplish what I want. I don't like losing. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that stuff was fun, but I said, I mean, our coach was, you know, you got a couple of weeks off. You got to start practicing again. You're back at square one because you don't, <laughs> you don't save all that in shape stuff. You mm -hmm. get, you're back at square one. So it wasn't too hard for me. And I was always a humble person, but I still lived in the reality of the world of where I came from. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I still get family members struggling. You still get all the issues that go along with those things. It's still, still got to go to class, you know, <laughs> I still mm -hmm. get homework. So I never really, um, thought more highly of myself than I should have. Uh, I don't think I've ever really recognized the magnitude of what I accomplished. Part of me, I don't really want to. I understand some of the things I did, especially now that I'm older. But back then, I didn't put a lot of thought into that stuff because I had to live life. You know, my, I had, we had these situations where, you know, I would have sisters or brothers who would show up here and laugh yet end up getting in the halfway house, get out, and then all of a sudden they just kind of migrated here. And so you'd have all those issues here. Um, but I was, you know, I had day-to-day -day stuff to do that I still had to take care of. You weren't trying to, uh, was there ever a time where you were trying to get away from those problems? No, they, I was, no, they were just there. I mean, I don't think they affected me to the point where I was, my concern was having a better life for myself. You know, I wanted a wife, family, a house. I wanted money. I wanted to be able to eat. I wanted to. And so I was driven by those things. And then, of course, I was having so much success as an athlete. I'm driven about getting better because I got to get stronger, faster, technique. And I'm driven by, and I got to pass classes. So I had a, those were my focus. Um, those things. My family is my family. That's who, that's who they are. I love my family. Where'd you meet your wife? Well, she begged me to date her across campus, um, is my story, but no, um, <laughs> I, my roommate, I had three roommates. My best friend I grew up with in Shreveport was here, and a guy from Longview, Texas, 400-meter runner, Mon White, Jason Williams, we were here. Well, my roommate Mon was dating a girl from Sunset, Louisiana, right, right outside of Opelousas, the north, and... And I'd had a, a couple of girlfriends before. One dumped me, one I broke up with. And um, he said, I know this pretty girl, man. You need to come see her. Well, he was dating her aunt. I know. Weird thing. His aunt went to school here. She's a great athlete. And, and, but I found out both of my wife's grandmothers had, I think, 16 kids. So Only, only 16? Only 16. Okay. Big families out there. Yeah, right. <laughs> But her mom was the oldest of 16. So she has an uncle that's younger than her. And she has an aunt that's like one year older. Because her mom was the older than the family. When you get down to number 16, when they have kids, they're still her, <laughs> mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went out to the country, and, and, and she had a boyfriend. She didn't really want to talk to me, but her mom is a sports fanatic. She knows everything, and she knew who I was. This was in 88, before I went to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. and, Still and, an NCAA champion, though. Yeah, well, mom knew what was. Yeah, uh, no. She didn't care. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> but her mom's like, that's Hollis. You need to go out with them. And I think she was in a bad relationship with her boyfriend, but she just didn't want to uh, – break up with him. Couldn't but, stand the boyfriend. Right. So I worked through the mom, <laughs> you know. So from Seoul, Korea, I write her mom a letter. Stop. On, on Olympic paraphernalia, you know, and, just, and say, hey, it was so nice meeting you and glad to talk to you. Thank you for giving me your address, even though your daughter wouldn't, this and that, you know. Probably about 15 years later, I find out my wife still had that letter. It's like, that wasn't for oh, you. Man. <laughs> but I think the combination between me and her mom working on her uh, convinced her to go out with me when I got back.
Really? Oh, yeah. So you sent the letter. Come on, that's smooth. I, told, I wrote to the mom. <laughs> that's <laughs> smooth. Use your, use your resources here. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> oh, goodness. So, um, you know, you, Olympics four years later. All right. So 92. Yes. Totally different experience. <laughs> totally different experience. Um, you're married at this point? Yes, get married in 91. So, uh, you know, in between 88 and 92, you know, I went on to break NCAA records, American records, end up being number one in the world, 1989, 1990. Uh, pretty dominant in track and field, traveling the world. Um, my wife and I get married September 91. Um, she immediately get pregnant. I don't know how that happened. Um, Crazy. But the due date, July 23rd, is when my daughter was born. I don't know what the exact due date was. but When were you due to be in, in Barcelona? July 23rd. Oh. <laughs> July 23rd. So here's the difference, you know, because now my focus is, you know, in 88, there was no expectations. I went to enjoy myself, and I ended up with a silver medal. Didn't really know. 92, I pretty much know. I'm, I'm favored to win. I'm number one in the world, and I'm the favorite to win the gold medal. I'm... A little bit more confident, a little bit more arrogant. I got expectations. I'm going there. It's a business trip. Mm -hmm. I'm not going there. And so, but we're having a baby. And I had a root canal done before I got on a flight. So we ended up inducing labor uh, so that my daughter could be born on the 23rd. I slept at the hospital. I got up. I flew out on the 24th. I had dry socket on the airplane. Mm. So I, I, I get into Barcelona. With either the late 24th or 25th, I think I got on the 25th opening ceremony. Was there. I didn't go to the opening ceremony. I was like, I can't be on my feet. I got to jump two days later. So I didn't go to the opening ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, I go out there prelims. I make the finals. I go to the finals. Five, five of us tied. All of us jumped seven, eight. It was myself, the Cuban, uh, the Polish guy, uh, Australian guy. And who was the other? It was one other guy. Five people at seven eight. The bars at seven nine and a quarter. My top five jumps that year averaged over seven nine. I was I was having a tremendous year. And I watched four people in front of me miss. I happened to be fifth. Mm. I'm thinking, I'm Olympic champion. The track it was it was unfair. Uh, there's some video out. I have video of the the finals, but the track was a little bit downhill. We're coming from the track, running toward the infield. Mm -hmm toward the high jump. The high jump apron was on grass. So it was a little downhill and fast, which is not the best condition for me because I'm a speed jumper. So it always puts me too close. All right. So you have to start making adjustments if you slow down here. But so I was always a little close to the bar. So I, I only had two misses. I started at, at seven, four and they shot the gun for the hundred right when I got on top of the bar and I nicked it off. And so I made seven, four on my second attempt. I think I made seven, six and a half. And at seven eight, I nicked it off. So I only had two misses. I made seven eight on my second attempt. Okay. There were five jumpers who who cleared seven eight. The Cuban cleared seven eight on his first attempt. It was the, the guy from Sweden. The guy from Sweden cleared seven eight on his first attempt, and three of us cleared seven eight on our second attempt. So I'm behind uh, on misses, mm -hmm. which means you have to make the next height to win. You either have to jump higher or you win on misses. And so I watched them. I'm thinking, I'm an Olympic champion. I come flying in there. I'm too fast. I hit it on the way up. And my heart just dropped. Because, yeah, I mean, I just, because I know what it means now. And the weight of the situation is there. And I just drag myself off the pit and I go sit there and just thinking how I blew this. Because if they make that now, I have to jump 17. Mm -hmm. And I watched four guys miss. And so now I'm up again. I'm ready. The crowd's clapping. I'm on the, this is it. I get on top of it, come down on it. Oh. Now my heart's dropped. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I go through this routine, and they all miss their third attempt. And now I'm thinking, this is mine. And I crashed the bar. Hmm. And I'm crying because I didn't think I, I got a medal. I blew it. Um, and you don't go anywhere because they're drug testing everybody. You know, you have to sit there while the, the winner's still jumping and wait till it's over because you're all going straight to drug testing. And I'm just sitting there crying. And then the official comes over, and they have a, they're showing me, I have an E by my name. I was like, what does that mean? And they said, tie. It's like, I got a medal. They gave out three bronze medals. 
It was five of us on the stand, gold to silver and three bronze. I'm like, yes, I got a medal. And so I'm, 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 I'm happy as I'm walking toward out of the track and they have a group of people, cameras interview you right there, just a quick one. And they're talking and then they hit me. It's like, man, I just blew it. I just, I mean, I'm number one in the world. I've jumped this height over five times this year. The opportunity was there. And I blew it. And then I got sad again. And of course, you go through drug testing and stuff. And then you come out for the award ceremony. And I was like, wow, this is pretty cool. Mm. But it still kind of still bothers me today that I, I didn't take advantage of it. But then you think about, you know what? I had a baby the day before I left. I had a root. I, I must have thought I was Superman. Mm -hmm. You know, and you just don't think about those things. And so my immediate thought was, I'm going to go to Atlanta and be the first high jumper to have a gold, silver, and bronze medal on our home course. And, and of course, uh, I ruptured my patella tendon in East. It was, it was, it was Germany, but it wasn't long after East and West had combined, but they would still put you up on the old okay. East side. Mm -hmm. And a uh, complete rupture of my patella tendon. The next year, for the, this is in 1995, uh, I keep training. I come back. I jump 1996, and I make the Olympic trials, and I'm in second place. And three guys jump a personal best, knock me off the team. Bar that seven six, my first attempt. I jump over the bar. I brush it. I'm standing. The crowd's going crazy. I got my hands up, and I hear the whole crowd go, "Oh!" I turn around. The bar rolls off, and then I miss it the next two times. I don't make the team. I leave Atlanta. Go to Paris snap my Achilles tendon on the same leg. So now I've had a ruptured patella and a ruptured Achilles. And this is 1996. So I, I go through rehab and jump, and I, I come back, and I jump seven, five and a half in 1997. It's an incredible height, but it's not enough to get me paid. Well, I've gone three years now without making any money because I've had injuries. Right. And I try to hang on another couple of years, and then now all of a sudden, I didn't waste my money, but, you know, just trying to pursue that. Mm -hmm. Now I got struggles. I got a wife and I got three kids. And so life changed then. Then I realized I need to get a job. But my whole life came from poverty to extreme success. You know, you go through an identity crisis. Who am I? What can I do? And and this university wrapped their arms around me and, and loved me. And I got hired here uh, under a guy named Danny Cottenham, who used to do the job that Christy does. He was over there academic center for athletes and I was a, a academic counselor for athletes and, and working here and kind of moved me in the line toward this this process. Your three daughters all involved in track? Oh, up? absolutely. What else would they do? Come on. <laughs> well, I take that back. My, my two oldest um, got into competition cheerleading. They started cheerleading for bitty football when they were little. Okay. And and that is a monster cheerleading. It is a monster. I mean, just financial-wise, time-wise, because they go through all the gymnastics, all the cheerleading training. Uh, um, you're there all day. And so they did cheerleading through middle school. I mean, we spent many days getting ready for tryouts and sitting on the computer waiting to see if they made the team, all of that kind of stuff. Going to cheerleading competition, they last all day because they don't announce the results to the end. And so you had 80 million cheerleading teams cheering. Mm -hmm. um, you had to sit through a lot. Huh? You had to sit through a lot. And, and so, but they were really good, and they, they cheered, and um, they never really liked track. And, and I had the philosophy, I'm not going to force them to do anything they don't want to do. They don't, I don't have to relive my life through them. And, uh, but my oldest daughter went out for track, and she was long jumping. And I thought, she could be pretty good, you know, as a sophomore, sophomore in high school. And she jumped like 16 feet, and, you know, it was like, that's going to be really good. Next year, she jumped right at 18 feet. We're thinking, she's going to be really good. And then we hit a wall. We just could not get her to get up in the air. We just mm -hmm. couldn't. Uh, this is our senior year, and she's getting beat. And it's like, well, let's just try to triple jump. And the first meet, she comes out, and she jumps like 35 feet and wins. And next week, 36 feet. And this girl just runs down and jumps straight up in the air and beats her. And say, I say, let's go back and put some speed to it. Well, the next meet, she jumps almost 39 feet. We're like, whoa. And she ends up, you know, going to state, get recruited, and she comes here and jumps, and she ends up jumping, I think, 41 feet, 42 feet. She had the second longest triple jump here at school. Um, but I thought she could have been a lot better had her heart been in it, and she started earlier. Hmm. But she never really wanted to do track. But she, she had success here. Uh, my middle daughter 
or the high jumper. We had a rule in my family. You know, I wanted a son. That's all I wanted was one son. My wife just did not want to do right. Um, <laughs> I did everything I was supposed to do. Um, but I was going to name him Hollis Jr. and call him HJ for the high jump. Mm. Perfect oh, plan. You had a nail. <laughs> and so we had a rule. We had a son. I'm naming him. We have girls. You can name him. Well, we had three girls. And so my wife lets me name the middle daughter. And I take an S off my name and call her Holly. Mm. And I call her Holly Gabrielle because I wanted to name her Gabriella after Gabriella Sabatini. It's a tennis player, mm-hmm. but um, Holly Gabrielle. And, uh, and she was my high jumper. And so you can imagine when people say now up in the high jump, Holly Conway, the eyes go to her. She was horrible. <laughs> she was beyond horrible. <laughs> you know, and uh, I think, you know, in her freshman year, she jumped 5'4", which is pretty decent. But then she mm-hmm. went down from there. And so she loved it, and she ended up, uh, you know, being in the choir. Just kind of a regular childhood. She was a competition cheerleader. She was mm-hmm. really good. Um, she triple jumped, and she made it to state in the triple jump. She jumped like 35, 34 feet, you know, which is different from a sister who jumped almost 39 feet. Right. But she made it to state, and uh, she ended up going to Northwestern on a theater scholarship. She got into theater very late. There's just not a lot of opportunity for young black girls, a lot of roles. Um, and in Monroe, there's not, a, they have a great Strauss theater that puts on some production, but we just got into it really late. But we knew she could sing and she was just kind of a background singer in, in choir in high school. And to her senior year, she got a couple of solos where she goes to Northwestern, gets into musical theater, and man, it just takes off. But she kept running track. And she and, and my wife and I, we made everything. We made every one of our kids track meets, every one of the dance. We made everything. And I had to tell her, I said, look, I'm not coming to another track meet to watch you no height. <laughs> no height means <laughs> you know, the opening height, you don't make anything. Um, but, you know, her career turns out incredible. She worked for Carnival Cruise Line. She's the current Miss Louisiana. She almost won Miss America. And she's got an agent. She's moving. It. She's incredible. It what worked was, out for her. What was that moment like, seeing her on stage and? Nerve, right? You don't you don't get to enjoy that moment, mm. you know, because going into the competition, you know, when she when she went ran for Miss Louisiana the first time, I tried everything I could to talk her out of it because I just didn't think it had nothing to do with getting to Broadway. Mm. I was like, you want to be in Broadway? We got singing, and dancing, and you got to tap ballet, you got to do all the things, you got to do it. And she was like, Daddy, you can win money, you can do this. I was like, what? Well, it's gonna take a lot of your time. And uh, thank God she didn't listen to me because the mom, all the women were like, you ought to do it. Mm. And so she goes in and she finished third runner up with like seven thousand dollars. You know, did all right like the first go round. Right? Yeah. So she goes the next year or senior year, finished first runner up. I mean, she's in the final two and and when I forget how much she won, but she won enough money to pay off all her school loans. But she graduated, so she had to work, and she ended up getting a job on Carnival Cruise Line, and she works for a year, and she's got one year left before she aged out. And I think she came back just to watch her friends compete and said, I want to give it one more try. And so she comes back, and she wins. But the whole process, you know, it's four days. They have preliminaries. You have to get to the finals, but, you know, interview and talent and just all the girls are incredibly beautiful, incredibly talent. And so you're sitting there just hoping, oh, will she make the top 10? And then you sit there, oh, I hope she makes the top seven. Oh, top five. And so you, you're just nervous the whole, the time. whole time. And then the crazy thing is when they get to the last two, they don't, they don't announce first runner up. Like they'll go fourth runner up, third runner up, second runner up first run up and then when you get down to the final well they don't say first run up they'll say you get two there then I, well if you're not the winner you go oh right, right. you know you got to get that reaction you got yeah, yeah, yeah you know yeah. you try not to have that reaction but yeah. you're disappointed yeah and then she wins and we think wow but immediately that night because the competition in 10 o'clock that night she immediately works for miss louisiana organization you start getting prepared for miss america which is in september and it's a lot of work and so you just get back into the mindset, but then you're nervous because you get there, and that's a 10 day deal. Mm. You had 51 girls, I think. And, and, you know, Atlantic City, the weather was it turned bad. And for singers, it was really bad. And then, you know, as a minority, we had to deal with, think about things that probably others didn't. You know, she's the only. She's only the third black Miss Louisiana. The one before her was 18 years ago, and the one before her was 18 years ago. Well, my daughter has natural hair. That's not 
uh, a common thing in pageants. And you wonder, should she straighten her hair? You start having those conversations. You decide, well, we're just going to go with this because it's so subjective. And you think, am I at a disadvantage? So you start thinking about those type of deals. Um, you're working through songs. You're working through platform. She and I had many nights talking about world issues and how do we approach them and how would we answer these questions and what's going so you're, on. So you're fully invested I'm in every fully, step. Well, we, we, anything our daughters do, all three of them. You know, my oldest daughter is a first grade teacher and we talk every day about those things. So we're fully invested in all three of them. Um, I think it's kind of unfortunate that myself and, and my daughter, what we do gets a lot of media attention, which is good, but sometimes you undervalue people who are in a classroom every day or our firefighters or our hospice workers who, you know, I have to tell people, I'm just as proud of all three of my daughters as I am the one that almost won Miss America. You may never know that because Miss America draws much more attention. And so, yeah, but we're fully invested. She would call me from cruise ships as soon as she get a signal and we're talking, okay, what's happening in the world? What do I need to know about? How do I, how do I answer this in a certain way? So, yeah, so we get there and man, you're just sitting there, you're nervous, you know, will she make the finals? So here's the inside story on on the final day when it when when it comes on the TV they announced the top ten, I think it was top ten or top fifteen whatever that number was. The parents, you have to stand outside. You have to have a meeting thirty minutes before, and you sit in there and say, okay, if they call your daughter out, then you come in and you sit in this section. They don't call your daughter out. You go up in the stands. So you don't know. You're sitting outside waiting to call your daughter. So you <laughs> they have designated seats for the top 15 parents right? so that the camera will know where you are. So then as they make cuts, if your daughter gets cut, you get up and you go up in the stands and everybody else get readjusted. So they always know where the numbers are so that cameras can, when they call a the daughter, they can find the parents and get their response. So it's, it's, it's a lot of stuff happening behind the scenes that you just can't sit there and enjoy because you wonder, like, oh, she is so good. And I don't know how you compare piano players to tap dancers to singers. And so you just, you never really, at least I never really know. And so every time they call the name out, you're really excited, but then you go back into And I think it, it I bet when she got into the top five, we was like, this is top. She could actually be Miss America. Um, and then they call two names out before her. We're like, this could really happen. And then they called the name out. We're like, are you kidding? Those two beat her? <laughs> no, <I'm kidding>. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so it, it, it was a crazy, crazy journey. But um, let's, let's be honest here, Hollis. You, um, you didn't stand a chance coming out in Chicago. Um, oh, no, no, no. Um, you know, a broken household, um, misshapen head, came born <laughs> out the gate, um, drugs, alcohol throughout your life. Um, how did you find a place where you're so stable and where you were motivated day to day to be around your daughters, be a strong husband? What, what, is, what in you found that? Uh, I'm I'm strong in my faith. Uh, I've grown strong in my faith. It wasn't always a driving factor, but I, we always we grew up in the church, and there was always, um, I believe God had a plan for my life, and I think, um, you know, I was singularly focused trying to escape those circumstances as an athlete. But I was blessed that I I was so successful so early. It allowed me to to see more things. You know, I, I was traveling. My first year I went to Europe. I stayed over there two months. I would just go from country to country and I'd stay. Matter of fact, the, the uh, head of the British Track and Field Association liked me, so he put me up in the Queen's Hotel in Crystal Palace in London. And so I would go to my track meets out of there and come back there. But having a world perspective, because my friends were from all different countries, and my, one of my best friends, Brian Brown, who came out of New Iberia, went to Northwestern State, who was a world-class high jumper. Uh, he and our paths were the same. He's actually, um, he was, um, he's head of a program in Missouri that deals with diversity and inclusion. Um, when you, when you, ha you surround yourself with people, you live real life. I didn't, I didn't. I didn't always live in that uh, dream world of being a world-class athlete, travel. I did all those things, but I still always came back to the real world. So it was always, I wasn't allowed to get the big head because I was living in real situations. I was around people who would quickly remind me that I'm, mm -hmm. not, I'm not only that guy. And then I never really wanted to 
to flaunt that in front of people because the people are around. I, I didn't want to be condescending. I didn't want them to think that I was better than them. So I was always humble. And so I always had something to do. There was always the focus, you know. Uh, I met my wife. We realized quickly, and I believe it's always a God thing, that there were not really many stable marriages in our families that we could model ourselves after. So we, we made a decision to try to be different, and we were part of marriage groups at our church, and we surrounded ourselves with faith. And then when we had our kids, um, we wanted to be a part of their life and, and do what they do. And so um, a lot of it was my faith and and and. Uh, spiritual advisors through our marriage, um, but driven to be successful. You know, I wanted to um, have a house, you know, so you end up saving, you buy a house, you have people who can help you buy a house, you know, those things. So a lot of those decisions, when you look back, people think that they're huge decisions, but it's just day by day making the next best decision. People look for these big grand ideologies and perspectives, but just day by day, treat people right, make the right decision, be humble, be thankful. You get to where I am today. I wish I made a lot of different decisions when I was younger. I didn't, you know, we live in a world where people are going back and discovering things that people did when they were young. And I, I, I can tell you now, you go back, I was young and dumb and I did a lot of dumb things. So you will see something. I am not that person. I've grown, but you know, um, that keeps me humble. Every time I, I think about all the great things I did, I think about all the stupid things I did. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, <laughs> I would not be where I am today. So, no, I, I don't put a lot of value on, on me doing some extraordinary stuff. I just think having the right people around my wife was has been an angel. I mean, I traveled, man. I'd be gone. She stayed hold down the fort. You know, we didn't all get in fight over you never come home and this and that. She never had to worry about me running, chasing after women. Um, just God surrounded me with the right people. She was always there. Always there. No complaints. No com Well, you know, marriage. We've been married 27 years. Well, you, know. you know, she probably got some, a whole lot of legitimate complaints. But, you know, um, we're not we're not people who argue we're not gonna scream at each other uh, i mean our bad trade is we shut down i mean we get mad we just ain't gonna talk to each other mm -hmm. if never any physical abuse of going on i was always so skinny i never had a bone on my i never wanted to pick a fight with anybody mm -hmm. and so we just we never any none of those things not make us better than anybody else it's just not who we were you know i don't drink i don't smoke never have doesn't make me better but I just never have you know and so um we just did the best we could Diversity, leadership, and education, the current role that you're in with the University of Louisiana. Yes. Um, what would you say you're heading into retirement 20 years from now? What would you say you would love to see happen under your tutelage here at the university? Well, it's, that's a broad title. You know, one of the things I had to do when I was trying to find myself at the end of my career, because I tell people all the time, what makes an athlete great is the same thing that hurts them at the end because you feel invincible. I, I still feel right now that I'm that guy and I can go out there and do those things. Now, wisdom and age has told me I can't. My body just won't do it. But there's nothing in me. I have to fight the urges to not be that guy. So I couldn't quit even though my career was in decline. I retired three years probably after I should have because hmm. I still thought I could do it. And it caused, you know, financial decisions, choices, uh, um, things um, that would have been a lot better had I not been that guy. So I, um, what I had to do is I, one day I, I, I researched myself. I put my name in Google and tons of stuff came up and I started reading stuff and I, and I didn't know I'd been speaking to school. I'd been doing all the things that I am now without even knowing it because it's just who I was. And so I was saying, Hollis Conway spoke here to Prince. He was great. The kids loved it, looked at the message. And I was like, wow, I think I could do that. And then I started wondering, like, I would see they had speakers come in before and they get that speaker $500. They give them a thousand. Like, well, they didn't give me anything because I never asked for anything. And I just reached I said, I need to make this a, a, a business. So I researched motivational speaking business and, and I did all those things, website, books, and, and all those things. And, and, and I just enjoy encouraging people and being able to go. I always wanted to go places where I you know, where felt we couldn't go as black people. I couldn't go as a male. I couldn't go as whatever, you know, if I was Baptist, if the, you know, we talked about the Pentecost. I, so I always, I'm drawn to build relationships, open doors and be nosy. <laughs> so, um, 
I found that when I'm being around people makes me alive to be able to say something. And and I'll tell you what really there was an eye opening. I, I, I researched something called the elevator pitch. You know, you have to as a speaker, you know, when someone asks you, what do you speak about? You need to you need to be able to do it in like 15, 20 seconds mm. and you need to leave them asking you for more. You don't tell them everything. You don't. The worst thing you say, I speak on anything. So I had to start honing messages of what I believe. And a lot of it revolved around athletics. I found that people want to know about what I did, my journey, and it inspired them. But I used to, people say, you went to Olympics? I say, yes. You know, it's okay because I'm thinking about it. I didn't win, you know, and I would do that all the time. And somebody said, you know, you missed a divine opportunity to speak something to their life that would spark a light that would change their life. And so I started practicing it, and somebody would say, did you go to the Olympics? i say, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And their eyes would open up. Tell me about it. And, I, and then I would end up saying, you know, if you tap into your dream or anything, I realize it's an opportunity to change uh, generations. And so that's kind of been, that gives me energy. I, I feel better when I'm helping people than I'm talking about myself. I'll use that stuff for that purpose. And so I researched myself, and I, and I found that, I've done some incredible things as an athlete. Um, track doesn't always get the recognition, so I fight that. You know, um, you know, we live in a football in America: football, basketball, baseball. You know, golf. Uh, over in Europe, it's soccer, it's track and field, two biggest sports in the world. And so, I've I've been on a mission to be known more for me helping and encouraging people than I am as a high jumper. That's been a secret mission of my mind. You, you, you just kind of opened up a secret not many people know. And so everything I do, no matter the job title, no matter where I am, is to make a difference in people's lives. And so while I'm here, no matter what that job title says, I need to make a difference in, in our senior staff, in the, in, the, in the faculty and staff, in our student athletes, in the students on campus, in the diversity department. I need to be able to use everything that has happened in my life to maybe say one thing that would change the direction of not only the people that I've been with, but maybe their families and the generations to come. So I would like for people when I'm gone, dead and gone, to say, that guy made a difference in my life. I don't want them to say, that guy went to the Olympics. He was an incredible athlete. That's fine. But if that's all people say about me, I failed in life horribly. Two-time Olympian. Two-time Grasshopper. Grasshopper, the high jumper. Hollis Conway, thank you so much for the time, brother. Thank you. You're awesome. Appreciate you, brother. Thank you.